and welcome to podcast.net, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter or Google+, and please give us feedback. You can leave a review on iTunes so that other people can find the show, send us a tweet, send us an email, leave a message on Google+, or you can leave a comment on our show notes. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. We are recording today on December 16th, 2015, and your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. Today we are interviewing Scott Sanderson on algorithmic trading. Scott, could you please introduce yourself? Hey everybody, um, I'm Scott Sanderson. I'm an engineer at a Boston-based startup called Quantopian. Um, and what we do is we build tools that allow anyone to do algorithmic investing uh, in the browser with Python. And most of that is built on a stack of open source software. Um, so much of what I do is sort of built around uh, the SciPy stack and building tools that enable people to do uh, open reproducible data science, uh, especially in the sort of financial domain. Very cool. So how did you get in introduced to Python? Um, so the very first introduction to Python I had was my senior year of high school, I think. So that would be 2009. And I did like the, you know, basic intro to computer science class, which is, you know, here is, here is a program, here is Hello World, here's, you know, loops and conditionals and all these other kinds of things. And then uh, I went off to college at Williams College, which is a small liberal arts college in the northwesternmost corner of Massachusetts. Um, and I didn't do much programming for the first two years that I was there. So I was a math and philosophy major, actually. So a lot of ideas that are sort of related to programming uh, and a lot of the stuff that I was interested in there was like foundations of math and set theory and that sort of thing. So it was a lot of stuff that has sort of intellectual roots that are very tied to programming. But I didn't actually come back to programming until uh, the end of my sophomore year. And they have all these courses that are sort of like gateway drug courses to trick people into doing programming. So I took a course that was actually on game design. Um, and it was half like art class and like some very basic statistics. And then they teach you some intro to Java programming. Um, and so that sort of got me hooked back on programming stuff. And then the next summer I uh, ran into John Fawcett, who is the CEO here at Quantopian. And he had just built the very first prototype of Quantopian. And it was like a, you know, it was just him like working out of his garage basically. And he, uh, I got in touch with him because his brother was coaching wrestling at, uh, with my brother at a school in Newton and he was looking for people to like beta test the first prototype of Quantopian and he wanted people who had you know mathematics uh, or like backgrounds that he thought would be interesting for quant finance and so we got uh, talking about that and I was really interested in it um, and we got along very well so I ended up interning for at Quantopian that summer and that was sort of my first uh, real experience with Python. And as a result of that, I, I really enjoyed that experience. I, I learned a lot from that. Um, and that sort of convinced me that I wanted to pursue software engineering as a career. And so I ended up going back to school, doing a whole bunch more programming, uh, almost ending with a computer science major in addition to the math and philosophy stuff. And then uh, after I graduated from uh, college, I actually was looking at a couple different things. And because I got into programming so late, I uh, I originally sort of uh, was debating between going back to Quantopian and doing a couple other things. And I decided to uh, try something new to just sort of see how I felt about it. And so I actually worked at a small game studio called Demiurge Studios um, that, that are based out of Cambridge for about nine months. And there I was doing some Python. So I was working on uh, a mobile app, actually a, a game that was on a whole bunch of platforms. But one of the things that it was on was mobile, but it had a backend server that was in Django. Um, and so originally I... I was there and I was working mostly on C++ um, engine level code, but I had this background in Python and especially Python web stuff from my original work at Quantopian. And so I ended up gravitating toward doing that work at Demiurge. Um, and then after about nine or 10 months, uh, actually, I loved that experience there. I, I have nothing but good things to say about the people at Demiurge. But one of the things that I actually really missed was the startup environment and also getting to work on open source software was is a big part of why I ended up coming back to Quantopian after that period of time. And I had kept in touch with uh, Foss, who's our CEO here, and he uh, sort of convinced me to come back and come work on Quantopian full-time. So I've been back for almost two years now, so since uh, March of the prior year. 
And do you have any insight into why he decided to choose Python as the lingua franca for doing the algorithmic trading and for exposing to end users? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I think is really unique about Python, uh, so like the other obvious choices are either like a very low level like systems programming language. So like if you're at a giant institutional quant shop somewhere, the workflow is often that you have people who are like data analysts or who are quant researchers. And what they do is they'll write their algorithms or they'll prototype their algorithms in R or uh, in like maybe in Python or in MATLAB, but in a language that's, you know, just really focused around data science. And then they'll hand it off to the engineering team who will then rewrite their code, usually in C++. Um, and so that often has, that is sort of introduces this whole translation layer where someone has to write the code in one language and then translate it into another language. And you can imagine if you're doing sort of a sophisticated quant financial algorithms, there's a lot of opportunities for things to get lost in that translation. And so one of the unique things about Python um, is that it can sort of bridge the gap between the low-level systems programming stuff that you need to be efficient enough um, while still providing a lot of nice high-level APIs that people who are doing the sort of more exploratory data science work uh, want to do. So things like uh, NumPy and Pandas and the whole sort of scientific Python ecosystem uh, make it a really compelling uh, platform for doing for actually implementing like the statistical pieces of the quant models. But then the fact that Python's a really great language for interfacing with more low level code. Um, and it also, the fact that, you know, if you're doing, Python's very unique in that it has both a really robust numerical computing uh, community and also a really robust web programming community, which I don't know of any other languages that really hit the intersection of those two things. So obviously Quantopian, you know, the main thing is it's a website. Um, and so we have large portions of our stack that are built around some of the Python sort of web framework stuff. And it's great that we can be able to use Python for sort of both ends of uh, our stack. And for anybody who doesn't know, can you explain what algorithmic trading is and how it differs from high frequency trading? Yeah, so, I, so algorithmic trading very broadly is any uh, investing or trading where the placement of your orders are is not made by a human being pushing a button somewhere, but it's automated by uh, a running computer algorithm. So generally what that looks like is you have some program that's running on a server somewhere and it's getting fed a constant stream of pricing data and other data as well. So things like uh, company fundamentals or like sentiment analysis or all these other uh, interesting data sources is one of the things that people are working on. But the so that's algorithmic trading very broadly, right, is any form of investing where you're where it's a computer that's placing the trades and that's making that's doing the business logic. Uh, a sort of narrow subset of algorithmic trading, which is what gets a lot of press, is this notion of high frequency trading, which is uh, you hear about, you know, these giant firms on Wall Street that are like, you know, co-locating with the exchanges and building these, these fiber optic networks and all this stuff. So these are all people who are. The, the main distinction between HFT versus just algorithmic trading is that they're trading much, much faster. So their principal advantage is that they're trading, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of times a second, and they're making decisions on micro or nanosecond frequencies. And so uh, I guess to, to answer your specific question, so HFT is a specific kind of algorithmic trading, which focuses primarily on execution speed and on uh, market making as the way that it generates returns. And can you give some insight into the kinds of algorithms and libraries that are commonly leveraged for algorithmic trading and some of the mathematical principles that are necessary to be able to write effective algorithms for, for those purposes? At the core of uh, pretty much any project in Python that's doing serious numerical work is NumPy. So that's the sort of uh, low-level n-dimensional array library that uh, lots of things are built on top of. And that provides really, that's one of the reasons that you can do this work and be efficient enough um, is that NumPy allows you to write what looks like nice high-level Python code, but then the heavy number crunching happens uh, in C and highly optimized uh, um, code inside NumPy. And then it also provides really good interfaces to uh, a bunch of linear algebra routines that are the core of a lot of uh, the business logic of these algorithms. Um, and then, so NumPy sort of sits at the base of the SciPy stack. And then at higher levels, you have libraries like Pandas, which is uh, an 
and or mostly a two dimensional, but it has uh, higher dimensional tabular and labeled data um, library. So that's really great for. It also has really robust support for time series data, which is an important part of any sort of financial analysis. Um, and so those are sort of the building blocks in terms of which people are writing their algorithms. And then the specific challenges that you have for uh, writing an algorithmic trading strategy is basically at any given time, what you're saying is given all the information that I know about the world, do I want to make any trades? And so generally speaking, the way that you bifurcate that problem is you say, well, given you know my view of the world and all the data that I have, what are my desired uh positions, like what are all the assets that I wish I could hold if I could just wave a magic wand and say, these are the positions that I now hold. And then once you have sort of a desired target portfolio, you say, well, given that that's where I'd like to be and given that this is where I am now, how do I move to point A to point B? And as you get, especially if you're managing a large portfolio, there's a lot of interesting subtleties in terms of like, how do you go from point A to point B without having a large impact on the market or being reasonably sure that things will execute at the, tra at the prices that you expect them to? Um, and then with that first piece, right, of how do I decide what positions that I want to hold or how do I decide what uh, portfolio allocations I have, um, a lot of that sort of turns into the, a big like convex optimization problem where you're basically doing this big, you're, you can think about it as sort of this giant vector space of, you know, the basis elements are each uh, asset in the possible set of equities that I could ever, or in our case, U.S. equities and soon U.S. futures. But in general, if you're trading, you know, all N assets, say, um, you can sort of think about it as this like very high dimensional space where the unique elements are all the different assets you can trade. And what you're trying to do is filter that down into uh, usually a, a much smaller dimensional space, which is the uh, particular portfolio elements that you're going to have at any given time. And so it's, there's a bunch of sort of uh, canonical examples of like simple kinds of trading strategies. So like very broadly, you have a class of strategies which are which are called like statistical arbitrage. Uh, and basically the idea there is you're identifying some statistical property of the market that you think has held in the past and you have reason to believe will hold in the future. So like a common example of this is something like a pairs trade where you say, I believe that, you know, stock A and stock B are correlated. Say so it's something like, you know, McDonald's and Burger King where the nature of the businesses that they're in, you have reason to believe that if McDonald's goes up, then Burger King might go up, or if McDonald's goes down, Burger King might go down. And so that by itself isn't a trading strategy. But if you have some thesis that says, like, you know, I think McDonald's is going to outperform Burger King over some time period, then something that you might do is say, uh, well, I'm going to buy, and I'm going to go long, I'm going to buy, you know, $1,000 of McDonald's, and I'm going to short, which essentially amounts to buying negative shares of Burger King. And so what that says is that you're not exposed to the movement of the market as a whole. So, right, so if you just believe that a given stock is going to go up, um, then you're, you would just buy that stock. And then if it goes up, then you predict it correctly and you make money. So a more sophisticated strategy is something like if you believe that you have some statistical relationship about the relative motion of two stocks, then what you can do is something like a pairs trade where you go long one of them and short the other one. And then if the whole market moves, right, if everything just goes up or down by 1%, then the value of your position doesn't change because you have you know one share in stock A and negative one share in stock B and the gains from one cancel out with the losses from the other. But if you're long one and short the other one and then just the one that's long that goes up, goes up or if they both move up but the one that's long goes up more, then the net effect of that ends up being that you you make money. And so the idea there is that if you can identify some sort of meaningful statistical relationship between two where you can generalize this to sort of larger baskets. So in general, if you can identify some sort of statistical property of relationships between various different assets, then you can construct portfolios that will uh, make money if that if that relationship continues to hold. So that's sort of one very broad class of strategies that sort of gets called statistical arbitrage. Um, and then you have uh, another sort of more interesting class, or not a, not a more interesting one, but a different one is uh, doing things like uh, identifying criteria of stocks that you think are systematically under or overvalued. And that can be based on, uh, you know, their earnings, their earnings estimates or their balance sheet, or they tend to be more based on like the fundamental attributes of the company. Um, and so looking at those and trying to understand like, well, why might some company be, uh, you know, undervalued or overvalued, or especially if it's undervalued or overvalued relative to similar companies, 
um, if you can identify assets like that. Um, and often when you're doing that, you're doing it on very large, broad universes of stocks and uh, sort of doing these large scale screens and trying to identify things that you think are systematically over or undervalued and then placing bets based on those uh, those assumptions or those beliefs. And so one of the other things that you mentioned as factoring into trading decisions is doing sentiment analysis. And so does your platform also provide uh, various news feeds for your end users to consume to do that analysis in conjunction with the actual raw stock data? Um, so we don't directly provide any uh, so we're, like, we're not out like collecting any data like that. So one of the more recent things that we've started doing is we've built a data store um, through which various vendors can come and provide their data um, generally at a fairly substantial uh, markdown from what they normally sell at. So one of, one of the things that I like to talk to people about uh, with Quantopian is that there's sort of three historical barriers to entry uh, for doing quant finance if you're someone who knows how to do it or is interested in doing it. Um, so there's access to infrastructure. So that's things like, you know, servers and being actually connected to the market and all the sort of code pieces that you have to have. Um, there's access to capital. So if you actually, if you have some algorithm and you can connect it up to the market, then none of that matters if you don't have money to trade with it. And there's access to data. And that's uh, all these sort of different data sources. And so one of the things that uh, we've been working on in the last, uh, for the past, last nine months to a year is building out this sort of library of different data sets that people can bring in um, and import into their algorithms and use. Uh, and historically, that's data that's been very expensive because their customer base has been uh, like institutional quant shops and you know Wall Street hedge funds and people who have deep pockets and who are buying enterprise contracts. And so if you're uh, you know, a single individual, uh, most financial data is sort of priced out of what's in a reasonable price range for you. And especially if you're doing it sort of as a hobby or if you're trying to break into the field, it tends to be pretty expensive. And so one of the interesting things that we've been able to do with the data stores is because we're a single platform where uh, people can show up and use this data, um, it sort of provides like a retail market that hasn't existed up until now. And so uh, you mentioned sort of the sentiment analysis stuff. So there's actually uh, a bunch of vendors on there who they don't provide, some of them provide the actual articles, but that's pretty hard to work with because you have to be like training your own machine learning algorithms to make some sense of those. So what what many of those vendors do is they aggregate all of this uh, data and then their core business is writing machine learning models or writing sentiment analysis models. And they, they'll produce like a score or like an impact score. So they'll say, you know, on this day, the net aggregate news sentiment for Apple was, you know, plus one with an accuracy rating of, you know, some value. And so basically what, what they'll say is something like, you know, Apple's net, net sentiment was positive or negative and we're this confident about it. And so that the, the data that's sort of been ingested a little bit at that point tends to be um, the APIs that we're providing right now. I think in the inevitable fullness of time, we may try to give people more access to the raw data. Um, but we've started with data that's a little bit easier to consume and a little bit easier to work with and doesn't require as much deep, right? If you're, if you're just taking like the Twitter fire hose and trying to turn it into trading information, you need to have an awful lot of different kinds of expertise to pull that off. Absolutely. Yeah. And also providing the more raw data would necessitate increasing your infrastructure capacity as well for being able to actually perform the training on, on the subset of data and then actually running the generated models against the remainder data. So I can definitely see how that would prove, even just from an engineering perspective, rather challenging. And also, too, having to have the support for those additional libraries, whether it's the NLTK, which I know is quite popular, or any of the other natural language toolkits that are out there. Yeah, it's also like e even ignoring sort of the engineering challenges of how do I make the data available to you, even I think in some ways harder actually is how do I make an accessible API for that? So my sort of principal role here at Quantopian is, is API design. So I... It's sort of my role to think about like, well, what are the functions that you can call on your algorithm and what is, you know, there's sort of the nitty gritty tales of like, what are they named? What are the arguments? Like, what is that sort of what, how do you spell things? But in some ways, more importantly, is like, what are the underlying concepts that we're presenting to the user? Like uh, something that I talk about a lot with people here is this idea that 
any API that you design is normative in the sense that it is making an argument about how you ought to think about a problem. So when I'm presenting to you an API where, you know, you know, all that stuff I talked about where I said, like, you can think about a trading algorithm in terms of this, like, high dimensional vector space getting mapped down into a smaller vector space of, you know, weights like that. If I present an API where that's sort of the core abstraction, then I'm encouraging you to think about the problem in a certain way. And I think, at least for certain strategies, I think that's kind of the right way to think about the problem. But it's definitely, there's a conscious choice being made to encourage the user to think about a problem both in a way that's sort of tractable and effective, and that also sort of encourages them to decompose the problem uh, in ways that they can uh, tackle efficiently or tackle effectively. So I, I think even more than the technical challenge of like getting the data available and letting people run the models, it's also the sort of conceptual problem of if we have all this like radically unstructured data, how do I give you some uniform API for working with and thinking about that data? And for people who are using the Quantopian platform, have you found that there tends to be a sort of common background among them? Or do you find that you have lay people coming in and making effective algorithms as well? I would say there's a pretty broad mix of people. I would say most people who come to Quantopian and are successful have some sort of technical background, but the, the particulars of that technical background vary quite a lot. So we have a lot of students, both of like with math and CS or econ backgrounds or finance backgrounds. Um, we get a lot of people who are scientists by trade, um, people who do like physics or uh, chemistry or biology or math or that sort of thing. Uh, we get people who come from finance backgrounds who may or may not have a lot of programming experience. So they're people who are traditionally worked to used to you know working in Excel or working. Um, in a little bit less of like a robust programming environment. And so they'll come in with a lot of financial domain knowledge, but then their sort of hurdle is learning to program in Python. We do get a fair amount of people who uh, have learned to learn Python or learned to program at all um, coming into Quantopian. And so there's sort of this spectrum of people with financial knowledge and people with engineering knowledge. And most of our users fall sort of somewhere in between there where they're strong in one place, but maybe not in the other place, um, you know, and there, we get we do get some people who show up who are like have a whole bunch of knowledge in both of those places. And we have a whole, uh, we have some people who show up and don't have any knowledge, but are just interested and want to learn and uh, work at it and get better at it. But there's definitely sort of a broad range of people who uh, come and work on stuff here. Arguably, I would think that for the, some of the finance people that you mentioned with some of their high-end Excel knowledge, if you've seen what some people do with Excel between the macros and the VBA and things like that, I mean, some of it's pretty crazy. Like some of it, I'll grant and warrant that it, it is not a formalized programming language in the sense that Python is, but I feel like it at least rivals the complexity. So if they've learned that, they should be able to come up to speed with Python if not fairly easily, then it should be a fairly tractable lift, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the thing that people who are who come from an environment like that, they like they don't struggle with like how do I do math or how do I do that, but they struggle with things like not having immediate visual feedback, um, or with like understanding how to structure a Python program in a way that will be efficient, right? So things you get sort of in some ways basic things like, you know, if you append to the front of a list over and over in Python that for kind of low-level implementation reasons turns out to be slower than appending to the end of the list. So things things that are more sort of idiosyncratic domain knowledge. Um, and one of the things that I think helps a lot with that and one of the things that we focused on a lot early was um, building the community around uh, Quantopian. So, you know, you can come to Quantopian and write algorithms and, uh, you know, create your create your strategies, but there's also a big forum where people can share knowledge and make posts and share IPython notebooks is a relatively new thing and share backtests, which is especially unique in finance because finance is sort of historically this really secretive, you know, I've got my secret special sauce and that's how I'm going to make money and I can't tell anyone because then they'll steal my idea thing. So one of the things that I think is really interesting and unique about uh, the platform that we have is that we've built this place where people can interact and share and learn from one another. And you you still definitely get a little bit of caginess from some people, especially people who are newer, I would say, um, where they won't talk about exactly what they're doing, but they'll still ask programming questions. And they'll say like, you know, I'm trying to do, you know, I'm trying to 
you know, do this this NumPy thing and I'm getting a syntax error or I'm getting a index error and people will come and help them and talk to them about the implementation stuff. And so I think that's a really interesting thing. And also one of the things that often happens there is you get people with programming knowledge and people with finance knowledge and they meet up and they team up and they work on things together. And so you get that sort of collaborative aspect of the community that I think is really interesting. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned the IPython notebooks and when you were commenting on the uh, people with the financial background who are more experienced with Excel, not having the immediate visual feedback. That was immediately what I thought of, of being able to do things in the in the notebook and actually in line, either, either Matplotlib or Seaborn graphs to be able to see what's actually happening as they're transforming the data. And also totally. the, uh, the pandas, tabular displays in, in IPython notebook being nicely formatted. Yep. Yeah, so that was actually... Uh, when I first got back to Quantopian, uh, I did a couple small projects, and then for about six to nine months, my main project was building a hosted IPython notebook platform. Um, and so I worked a lot with the IPython guys directly, um, and particularly this was, they have a newer project that has come out um, called Jupyter Hub, which is essentially a multi-user IPython notebook server, and it was designed for a sort of um, small scientific computing lab. So they're, they were imagining on the order of 50 to 100 people talking to one of these Jupyter hubs at a given time. Um, and the idea there was be, you know, I have a lab at some uh, university somewhere, or, if I, or I'm teaching a class. Like one of, the, one of the really awesome things about the notebook is it's this great teaching environment. Um, and so they built this project that... Um, lets you basically have a whole bunch of notebook servers, and then it adds sort of login stuff and some basic, basic administration tools on top of it. Um, and so we've uh, taken that, and I'm actually running a cluster of these multi-user Jupyter hubs um, and worked with a lot of the IPython folks to bring features in that support that sort of large-scale use case. Um, and so we now ha actually have a big, I, th I think probably the largest uh, Jupyter Hub installation in the world um, running on a whole bunch of EC2 instances and we're dynamically creating Docker containers for people and connecting to them to notebooks. And that's been a really, really uh, exciting thing to see people take to that because uh, before that, you know, you could show up and you could write uh, trading algorithms, but in people who like do quant finance professionally, like it's their full-time job, they'll tell you that they spend maybe 10 to 15 percent of their time, you know, writing trading algorithms where they say, like, this is my idea. I'm going to write it and I'm going to test it. And they spend probably 80, 90 percent of their time just sort of exploring data and trying to do research and trying to figure out what ideas are even worth pursuing in the first place. And the notebook is such a great environment for that. Um, so I've been super excited about sort of the and it's also, you know, the fact that you can have the result of a computation be interactive, right? So like one of the really cool things about the notebook is that you can write an object whose like wrapper is a piece of JavaScript that then displays dynamically. And you can have like, an, you know, you can have like an Excel table that you can like scroll through and move and sort and filter and do all these things. We have one of the cool open source projects that we have is this library called QGrid that uh, is a sort of fancy representation for data frames where you say like show grid of a data frame and it renders it using this JavaScript library called slick grid. Um, and that gives you these like beautiful smooth scrolling things and you can filter stuff and edit them in place and have it take in your data frame. So it gives you this really interesting free flowing interaction between your code and your data and the representation of your data. Um, so I'm sort of really excited about the next two to three years of that project and what it's going to do for interactive computing. And one thing that I'm curious about is in terms of your platform, how interactive it is in terms of being able to develop the algorithms. I know you mentioned the Jupyter notebooks on the Jupyter Hub uh, clusters, but for people who are trying to test against live data, do you provide any sort of in-browser execution or do people have to sort of lay out the total format of their code and then submit it uh, en masse to be able to run against the actual live data for testing purposes? Yeah, so the so the way it works basically is it, a trading algorithm on Quantopian consists primarily of two functions. Um, so you write an initialize function which sort of sets up any basic state that you want to have in your simulation. And then you write a function called handle data that gets called every minute 
um, with the updates for that data. And so the first thing that we ever built was back testing. So back testing is basically you you write these two functions and then you say, well, if I had deployed this algorithm, uh, you know, in 2002 and run it up until now, how would it have done? Um, and so if you go to the IDE um, in Quantopian and you you write out your algorithm and then you can press a button that says, you know, run this from time A to time B and it'll give you sort of a little streaming graph that'll show you what your returns were over time and then you can tab over to another thing and investigate those returns more, more uh, closely and it'll give you there's a whole bunch of standard financial metrics that you can use to evaluate the performance of your algorithm. So that's, so you, like as you're developing your algorithm, generally what you're doing is, uh, you know, making changes, running back tests, seeing how it performs. Um, we also have an in-browser debugger. So if you, it has sort of a little like um, Visual Studio kind of interface where you can click on a line number and it'll set a breakpoint. And so you can run your, um, Run, run your back test with breakpoints set and then it'll pop up kind of a, like a Chrome's like JavaScript debugger style UI where you actually have a REPL that you can dynamically investigate the, the state of your process at any given time. Um, and then so once you've actually developed your algorithm, you know, and you're, you're satisfied that it, it's interesting to you, then generally what people do is move to paper trading where you can you deploy it and then it's sort of our infrastructure takes control of it and we'll actually start feeding it live updates of data every day and it'll will tell you your simulated returns over time um, and then obviously if you're if you're happy with your paper trading results or if you you're convinced that this is actually an algorithm that you want to deploy then you can connect it to an interactive broker's account and actually deploy it against capital and then from the algorithm's perspective one of one of the really interesting things about uh, the way that the system is designed is that from back testing to paper trading to live trading, your code is always the same, which is not true of a lot of uh, institutional systems where you have this rewrite gap, right? If someone writes the strategy in R and then somebody else ports it to C++ to trade against actual real things. Um, and that's sort of this terrifying prospect, right? Of we had this code that worked and we believe it was tested, but it was written in a totally another language. And then to actually deploy it live, we have to rewrite it in C++. Um, and so having a single code base that is you know, going through all these staging, all these pieces of uh, testing, I think is one of the interesting things that we've were able to do. Yeah, for that kind of scenario, I imagine that having some sort of test harness that actually allows for executing against the different language platforms would be very useful to verify that the actual translation was done appropriately. But also, I'm sure that people who are focusing more on the actual data manipulation aspect and don't necessarily have as thorough of a uh, your, your more traditional software engineering background might not necessarily be as rigorous with the testing that they do perform, if any. And so for the in-browser execution, are you using something like Python Anywhere, or have you built your own sort of homegrown solution to, to provide that capability? Uh, so, so the execution isn't happening in the user's browser. I should probably make that clear. So uh, you, the, the IDE is a, it's actually a Ruby on Rails app. So the, the place where you're typing is uh, it's Rails, and then the front end is Code Mirror, which is the same thing that uh, Lighttable is built on as a well-known project. And then when you press Build Algorithm, that takes your code and makes a post to a Flask server that then forks off a simulation process and connects it to the to a live data feed, and then that thing streams results back to the browser over a WebSocket. Um, and so the actual code is still is running you know, in AWS on on one of our servers. I'm assuming you provide some sort of sandboxing. Are you just using Docker containers for that, or do you have some other sort of mechanism in place? So there's a couple different layers of sandboxing. So that's one of the very interesting and in, uh, challenging parts of Quantopian, right, is for many websites, accepting other people's arbitrary code and executing on them on your servers is a pretty good definition of getting hacked. And for us, that's our core business. Um, and so we do sandboxing at a couple different levels of abstraction. So there's operating system level abstraction. So that's things like uh, making sure that the user's process doesn't have access to the file system, doesn't have the ability to like make HTTP connections, that sort of thing. And there's also Python level sandboxing. So we actually do uh, a lot of static analysis on people's code, and in some cases even uh, hopefully transparent dynamic rewriting of their code, um, as well as so that that's things like uh, verifying that you can't import the OS module, for example. So if your code contains the statement import OS. 
then we'll statically fail that and say you're not allowed to use the OS module because it does various unsafe things. And then you can imagine immediately, well, what about eval and exec and all these dynamic language features? So a lot of the uh, a lot of those dynamic features end up getting uh, disallowed on Quantopian. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's also runtime dynamic sandboxing as well for uh, things that are not necessarily easily catchable at, at uh, compile time or as much of a compile time as Python has. And so there's various different layers of static sandbox, or like static Python sandboxing, dynamic Python sandboxing, as well as operating system level uh, isolation. Does the Quantopian platform build in any safeguards to prevent users' algorithms from spiraling out of control and creating or contributing to a market crash? Yeah, so I, I mentioned, uh, you know, I had worked on that Jupyter Hub project and then I had done a small project before that. So the first thing that I actually did when I came back to Quantopian was building uh, a trading guards module in Zipline, which Zipline is the uh, project that's actually sort of at the core of Quantopian, which is an open source project. Um, and so what that provides is an API where you can say things like uh, set max order size or set max leverage or set uh, max position size so that your algorithm, you can basically say, I can never, you know, place an order for more than $10,000, or I can never place an order for more than 100,000 shares, 100,000 shares is a lot, but, you know, more than some fixed number of shares, or I can never hold a short position. Um, so things like that. So those are things sort of at the user, at the user's discretion that are just sort of good housekeeping for preventing logic bugs. So you can imagine, you know, if you accidentally write, while true, order one share of Apple, very quickly, that ends poorly for you. Um, so you, you as a user would just want to write, you know, add guards like that, that would prevent you, your algorithm from sort of spiraling out of control. Um, and then as far as you, you had mentioned like preventing users algorithms from contributing to a market crash, um, you at the levels of investment that people tend to be running on Quantopian, you would have to, it would be pretty hard to have a, like a truly large global impact on the market. You know, maybe if you're trading some very thinly traded stock, um, you could have a material impact on its price. But most people are trading on the order of tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars where the things you hear about in the news are people trading, you know, millions or billions of dollars. And they're also trading at a much higher frequency. So we talked a little bit earlier about that distinction between high frequency trading and algorithmic investing. And everything on Quantopian is happening at, at most minute resolution. So basically your algorithm gets gets its handle data called once per minute, and then it gets to make decisions there. And so the things you hear about like flash crashes or something like that, where you know all these algorithmic trading bots are running amok, tend to be things that are operating at much, much lower frequencies and that are all often sort of trying to follow one another and trying to mimic what each other are doing. Um, and so it's much harder to be like the kinds of algorithms that are really feasible to write on Quantopian tend not to lend themselves to that kind of extreme failure mode. That's, that's great. Um, it really makes me wonder then how, I guess when you look at the really sizable crashes, it wasn't just like one trading algorithm, right? It was mm -hmm. all the trading algorithms kind of joining hands and doing this horrid death spiral leap of doom. <laughs> <laughs> where we saw the, the big graph for the stock market just take this giant plunge. Mm -hmm. So that's good to know that it, it would be really tough for one user at least to trigger that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like the reality rate is like, you know, if you're trading even a couple million dollars, like that's such a tiny fraction of the market. You know, you basically have to be either a huge institutional fund or like you said, you have a whole bunch of algorithms that are implicitly correlated or that are all sort of secretly doing the same thing um, to have sort of the kind of major market impact that you're talking about. And so earlier you mentioned that part of the web interface for people to develop their code in is actually a Ruby on Rails app. And so I'm wondering in which other places you leverage languages other than Python and for what reasons you came to those decisions. Yeah, so I would say probably 60 to 70 percent of our stack is Python, um, depending on how you measure. So there's there's. Python is sort of the, most of the core services. Um, the front end is Ruby on Rails and JavaScript. Um, we also, for a lot of the performance intensive pieces of, uh, of our Python stack, we drop into Cython, which I don't know if you guys have worked with Cython at all, but it's basically sort of a, a 
Python-like language that then gets compiled directly into Python C extension modules. And so it's a really nice language for taking pieces of Python code that have become performance bottlenecks and transforming them into much more efficient code. So some of the, the really performance intensive pieces of Zipline are, have been ported to Cython. Um, and there's a couple pieces that are, I think, just in straight C. Uh, we have a couple services that are in uh, Go. And I, we, I think we have one script in Haskell, which the person who wrote the Haskell script is very proud of. It's a script for parsing a data vendor's documentation. It was written as a Haskell Alex Lexer. It's really funny. It, it seems like you know, everybody sort of says, well, Haskell's not useful for writing code in production. But what I've seen now is a number of different companies finding these really interesting kind of niche cases where, why, yes, in fact, not only is it useful for writing code in production, it's much better at it than some of the stock procedural languages that we're all used to because the particular problem domain really lends itself to Haskell's gifts. Totally. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I am actually finance is one of the places where, where functional programming has like taken a big hold. I would say the, the big player there is OCaml. Um, so there's a lot of big uh, institutional quant shops whose, or even just like in, uh, financial institutions that are running a lot of OCaml code. Uh, but Haskell is also a big one there. And so there's a, there's a couple pieces of that. One is that uh, pure functions are really easy to parallelize and they, they're, your compiler can do a lot of work for you, um, both from an optimization perspective and from a correctness perspective. And you know, you can imagine writing code in the financial domain, like correctness is a thing that really, really, really matters a lot because the failure mode for writing a bug is, you know, someone's money goes to the wrong stock or someone orders 10 times as much as they wanted to. So you really want to make sure that your your logic is ironclad. And so things like Haskell that can provide really strong static guarantees about the behavior of a program um, or that can, you know, encapsulate at compile time things like you're correctly handling errors of various sorts um, are potentially really powerful. I actually, so I gave a talk at PyData in New York maybe a month and a half ago uh, about a, a new wing of Zipline that I just added, which is basically this sort of little uh, DSL for describing um computations on trailing windows of financial data. And one of the subsections of that talk was called symbolic computation is eating the world. And bas basically the argument there was that increasingly what, what we're seeing in Python is that the high level interfaces to performant numerical code are uh, doing symbolic computation or deferred computation, which are sort of bringing back a lot of the traditional benefits of having a compiler where you have you're separating the representation of a computation from the execution of a computation, right? So if you're working with NumPy or you're working with Python dictionaries or Python lists, right, you have the data right at your fingertips and you can do whatever you want with it. And so there's there's this nice immediacy to it, right, where you can do exactly what you want and you get to think, even in Python, sort of you get to know exactly what's happening to your data. The flip side of that is you have to know exactly what's happening to your data and you have to tell the computer exactly what's happening to your data. And so what we're seeing now in libraries like uh, Blaze and Dask and Google just released TensorFlow as their big new machine learning library and things like uh, Theano. And there's this whole sort of litany of libraries that have sprung up or become much more popular in the last two to three years. And this, the thing that they all share in common is this idea that they're separating the representation of, an, of a computation where by that, what I mean, like you, you build up in memory, you're not working directly with your data, but you're working with like expression objects where, you know, you know, you do, you have something that represents like an abstract array and you do my array plus my array plus my array. And if you actually had a NumPy array, then Python has to go execute that. And one of the consequences of that is you're constantly creating and throwing away temporary arrays, for example, because if I have, you know, a big, you know, gigabyte size array and I add it to itself and then add it to something else, well, I didn't actually need to allocate a whole nother gigabyte array and then immediately throw it away. Um, and so one of the things that you can do when you have the symbolic computation layer, right, is you get to see the whole expression at once, uh, which is a thing that you never get to do in standard Python where everything is just getting interpreted on the fly. So if you have uh, 
an abstraction layer where you can say, well, here's the entire expression that I want to compute, and then you feed that into some execution engine, then you get a bunch of really nice benefits. So one of those things is, like I said, you know, you can do optimizations on it that you can only do if you see the whole expression. Um, and the other thing you can do is when you've separated the representation of computation from the execution of computation, well, then you can mix and match the executions, right? So you get, have libraries. Uh, one of the things that one of the libraries that a lot of people are uh, excited about recently is this library called Dask, which is a library for uh, doing parallel computations or out-of-core computations on NumPy or Pandas. And there's a new arc of it called Distributed that uh, Matt Rockland, who's a guy at Continuum Analytics, has been uh, sort of building out as the newest wing of that. And one of the cool things about that is you build up these abstract uh, computation objects, which internally are basically represented as like S expressions, sort of Lisp style. Um, and then what you do is you you build up with these abstract array objects your expression, and then you feed it to some executor to get run. And the cool thing about that is you can there's like a single threaded executor, but there's also a multi threaded executor, and there's a multi process executor, and there's even this distributed executor where you say take the take my expression and farm it out to my giant cluster of machines and compute all the pieces of it in parallel, and then cobble them back together and send them back to me. Um, and so one of the things that I I think we're going to see more and more of in Python, especially for scientific and high performance computing, is this idea that you're not going to work directly with the data, but you're going to work with more abstract symbolic representations of the data. That's interesting. And it also occurs to me that um, in addition to that level of abstraction and symbolic sort of representation that you're talking about, which has such huge wins when you're manipulating such large data sets, it occurs to me that with things like Haskell, and I realize some of these kinds of libraries exist for Python as well, some of the testing capabilities like you can kind of prove the correctness of your program could be really handy where actual money is involved. There's also the one of the big benefits is if it fails, you learn earlier, right? So if you're going to do some giant, you know, data crunching uh, algorithm, right, that's going to run for five hours on your cluster and do all this numerical stuff. And then the last step that it does is add an integer to a string and it crashes. It's really frustrating if you're doing that in Python, right, and you go through all that work and then the way that Python works is you don't learn about the failure until it actually happens at runtime. But if you've built up this abstract expression object and then you said executed it, well, then you can have some sort of some like type checking layer, right, even in Python that says, hey, you added an expression of type integer to an expression of type string. You're not allowed to do that. That's going to crash when I try to execute it, right? So like one of the traditional benefits of a compiler is that you catch certain kinds of errors before you ever even run your program. And that's what I think sort of the same kind of thing you're talking about with Haskell, right, where you get these strong guarantees where if you're, if we ever started to execute your program at all, then you have certain kinds of correctness guarantees that come out of it. And obviously you still have to verify that the actual core logic is correct and then you did, you know, you didn't subtract where you meant to add or something like that. But preventing yourself from making certain kinds of category errors uh, is a really big win sort of in your, terms of your productivity because you learn about errors faster. Yeah. And I think that that's also why there's been such a recent upsurge in both static languages and also in optional and progressively typed languages and layers on top of dynamic languages, even including the recent type module for Python 3.5, which has certainly caused some uh, <laughs> some contention in certain areas. But I think that because of the fact that it is optional, it still provides a lot of potential value, particularly in terms of being able to provide more effective static analysis of your source code, as long as you provide uh, accurate type annotations. Yeah, I think that I'll be very interested to see how that plays out, because part of it, I think, is that the... the the type annotation stuff is really only as valuable as if it's, it's really only truly valuable if it gets adopted. Uh, and so I think it'll be interesting to see whether, I think the big challenge for that in a lot of ways is going to be the Python 2.3 compatibility stuff because the, the annotation syntax I don't think is legal in Python 2 for it. Um, and so if you have libraries, you know, there's this large community of libraries that are trying to do single source Py 2.3 compat stuff. And if you want to leverage the type annotation system, then 
Although I guess you you have the interface file, right? You have those the right. like stub files, so you don't actually have to put them in source. Exactly, and I think that that was a big reason for Guido adding that capability as well, is so that you can still have the two to you know two and three compatible libraries and mm -hmm. not having to directly modify the source while getting some of the benefits of the optional typing. Yeah, the... guys, is this type hinting? Is this yeah. what we're talking about? I just want to make sure I understood what you were referring to. Yes, uh, I was just going to say in uh, Python 3.5, there's a new type module where you can actually provide type annotations in function definition. The intended purpose is for IDEs and static analysis libraries right. to be able to provide ahead of time checking to make sure that the types of the arguments are appropriate, both for the arguments to the function itself as well as the return values. I was just curious if this was the same thing that Guido gave the talk on at Python 2015. Yes. Where he basically said, yeah, okay, good. You know, there's kind of no point for raised hackles because he, he made it very clear, like, this is a completely optional concept. It's mainly intended for companies with ginormous code bases like Google and the like, which, as you said, need to perform better static analysis um, and maybe IDEs if you choose to use it and the IDEs support it. But... You know, he made it very clear that this, like, this was in no way, shape, or form. You know, we're not going to make Python a typed language all of a sudden. Right, <laughs> and it's also an experimental module as well, so it's subject to future modification. Um, so the current API is subject to future uh, evolution. So what PyPy packages does, does Quantopian leverage in this platform? I know you've mentioned a few already, but let's just sort of round out the list if we can. Yeah, so we we maintain a couple. So Zipline is our sort of big flagship one, which is the, the backtesting engine that's at the core of Quantopian. And that's what provides all the APIs that I talked a little bit about. And then it has... Uh, classes and stuff that let you import your own data uh, if you wanted to if you wanted to run an algorithm sort of in the Quantopian style but run it on your own machine then Zipline is sort of the place where you do that and the caveat there is you have to actually have your own data as well um, and then a more recent library that we released maybe five or six months ago is a library called Pyfolio that's uh, a visualization and uh, algorithmic or it's a library for um, assessing the performance of trading algorithms so if you take basically like the return stream and the positions and the transactions and all the sort of exhaust of a back test or of a live trading algorithm, you can plug it into Pyfolio and it does a bunch of cool visualizations that let you uh, get a sense of what your algorithm is doing and like uh, which which positions it's holding, it's making money or which which positions are not making money or and how, to, how it did at various points of like turbulence in the past, that sort of thing. Um, and then we have a couple smaller libraries. So I I have a library called PG Contents that uh, does um, IPython notebook storage in Postgres instead of on your local file system. Uh, we have that library QGrid I talked about that's for data, for, data frame representations. Um, so th those are the ones that we maintain. And then obviously I talked a lot about being built on top of like NumPy and Pandas and SciPy and Matplotlib and Seaborn. So all these sort of standard uh, scientific computing libraries for Python. Um, and obviously IPython and Jupyter, that whole... Uh, computing framework is what the whole research platform is built on top of. Um, and then some other ones that we use off the top of my head, uh, SQL Alchemy for uh, talking to SQL databases. Uh, we use Flask for most of our Python web stuff um, and Gevent for the uh, Gevent and some stuff using, I don't know if it's pronounced G-Unicorn or I, I tend to read it as Gunicorn because I find that word hilarious. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's the web server stuff. Um, there's also... An interesting one that sort of ties back to that symbolic computation theme I talked about a little bit is uh, one of the libraries from Continuum Analytics, um, where the, the people who make the Anaconda Python distribution is this library called Blaze, um, which is this sort of abstract symbolic interface to lots of different data sources. And so the idea with that is you build up these like Blaze expressions, which are just sort of these abstract objects. And then you say, execute this Blaze expression against these NumPy arrays or against this data frame. But it can also do more exotic stuff. So you can say, execute these Blaze expressions against uh, a SQL database or against CSVs on disk or against like KDB plus or all these other crazy things. Um, and so we use that for some of our internal data loading infrastructure. And then we have some of our newer APIs, especially in that research environment, are built on top of Blaze. And we have one of our engineers here is one of the core contributors and maintainers of that library as well. And so sort of bringing it back to the beginning, how do the financial returns compare between algorithmic versus human trading on the stock market? Um, so that's sort of an interesting question to answer. So one is... Uh, 
it's not it's there's no like obvious way to say like oh well these returns came from like if you're just looking at all the trades that happen on the stock market like nothing publicly tells you you know these were placed by a computer and these were placed by a person i think increasingly also like the distinction between algorithmic trading and human trading is sort of getting blurred because there's like no one who's doing trading isn't using a computer for some part of it right you're always whether you're using Excel with your models by hand and then it spits out a thing that says you should buy the stock and then you buy it, or you're writing a computer, but you can send it, you know, manual messages to say, uh, buy the stock or another thing like the, the, the distinction between algorithmic trading and human trading, let's say is sort of getting increasingly blurry, I would say. Um, and so part of me wants to say, well, that, that question doesn't necessarily, makes sense increasingly but in a, in addition to that piece i think it's also actually quite hard to answer that question because like i said these uh financial trading firms are historically super secretive about what they do and how they execute and so it's actually quite hard i think to get good data about the returns of you know human driven investing versus algorithmic driven investing even insofar as you can make that conceptual distinction in, in some ways i just i answered your question by not answering it. No, that that's totally fair and very valid. And as you said, it's it isn't anything. Technology is increasingly blurring the line between what a individual human is capable of and what is uh, facilitated by the technology. We are gradually turning into the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, can you speak about any trends that you see in the trading algorithms people are creating for the Quantopian platform? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of that. So one of the things I talked about a bit earlier is this idea that we are always making these sort of normative decisions about how people should think about writing training algorithms and how what kinds of algorithms people should be writing. And so uh, a lot of what drives the kinds of algorithms that people are writing are the kinds of tools that we give them. So if you look back two or three years ago at what was possible in Quantopian or in Zipline, and there was no Basically, the way it worked is you had to explicitly say ahead of time, these are the assets that I, like these are the equities, you know, these 10 stocks or whatever are the things that I'm trading. And then you could only get pricing history for those 10 stocks. And then you could only place orders against those 10 stocks. And very quickly, you know, what we learned was that more sophisticated trading algorithms tend not to say these are the stocks I know about ahead of time and these are what I want to trade. But what they'll do is use more interesting criteria to decide you know, based on all the stocks that I could ever see or all the stocks I could ever know about, uh, what ones do I actually want to trade today and what ones do I actually want to care about? Um, and one of the things that we've done as we've uh, sort of evolved as a company, one of the things that we've started doing is trying to build um, the Quantopian hedge fund. Um, and the idea there is one of the sort of historical barriers to entry I talked about for Quantopian existing is access to capital. So we have all these users, we have this great community, we have all these people who are building interesting trading algorithms. And for many of them, the barriers are, uh, or one of the barriers to actually trading is not having the capital to deploy to their algorithms. And so what we've been doing uh, is, or what we're working towards and hoping to, to build and to become our core business model is building a fund where we can uh, raise institutional capital and then offer it to users on Quantopian and basically say, you've come to Quantopian, you've written this great algorithm, and we want to offer you uh, capital to run your algorithm and we'll pay you a percentage of your uh, performance fees and then we'll, you know, whoever's money it is that's actually trading, we'll get a portion of the returns and then we will take a portion of the returns for building the infrastructure and connecting the capital to the algorithm. Um, and so one of the things that we've done as a result of that becoming a focus is we've really tried to encourage people or make it possible to build tools that can do that can handle these large universe style algorithms. So um, for a bunch of uh, reasons, it makes sense for us to try to encourage people to write algorithms that hold many different positions at different times. The big one there is basically it gives you more reason to believe that it's actually correct and not just lucky, right? So if you imagine we're looking at this whole universe of possible algorithms and someone has an algorithm that had really, really good returns and it turns out that their algorithm just happened to buy Apple in 2003, right? Well, they're going to make a lot of money because Apple did a whole bunch of, I mean, Apple's value went up a whole bunch in that period of time. 
But that doesn't necessarily give us any reason to believe that we should invest in that algorithm if all it did was just happen to buy Apple at the correct time once. Whereas if you have an algorithm that every day is is based on some criterion, you know, choosing a different hundred names every day and investing, you know, allocating its capital toward those hundred names and then holding that position, you know, maybe for two weeks or a month or more or less than that amount of time. If you're making lots of independent bets and consistently outperforming the market, then maybe that gives us some reason to believe that there's actually something worth investing in in your algorithm. Um, and so we have very consciously chosen to encourage, uh, or not maybe not encourage, but we've chosen to develop APIs that let people do uh, let people trade with larger universes and let people look at larger, broader amounts of data. Uh, and part of that is just sort of the natural evolution of, of the platform technically. So when we first launched, we only sort of had the technical capacity, both because you know servers have gotten faster and because it was a simpler problem. We only sort of had the ability to stream your algorithm 10 stocks worth of data. And as we've built out the platform over time, we've increasingly given people the ability to look at more and more data over time. And as a result of that, they're able to trade strategies that incorporate more and more data and that look at more and more stocks. Um, and so that's sort of the biggest trend that I've seen over the last year and a half is looking at more data, looking at more kinds of data, and looking at larger universe sizes um, and incorporating those into their universe in a more dynamic way. So not just saying ahead of time, a priori, these are the things I care about, but rather it's sort of defining algorithmic criteria to decide what things your algorithm actually wants to trade. So this is just idle curiosity on my part. Um, I think we've gotten a pretty good idea of what kind of technical knowledge is required to get started writing trading algorithms on, on the Quantopian platform. What kinds of resources are required? How much money do you have to put into the till in order to be able to start writing algorithms and seeing how they, they work? The actual amount of money you have to put in is zero dollars right now. So all the stuff I just talked about is all free services. Uh, I think I think you meant that a bit more metaphorically. Um but so we, um, you know, it, it depends what your background is, I guess. You know, if you come in and you're one of those people that has a ton of finance knowledge, then your challenge is going to be picking up the Python. If you come in as one of these people who knows a ton of Python but doesn't know the finance, then you have to sort of pick up the other side of it. One of the things we've started doing in the last maybe nine months or so is we actually have a full-time engineer whose job is is building um, tutorials. So if you go to quantopian.com slash lectures, I think. Uh -huh. um, there's a whole lecture series that's basically going from like what is a trading algorithm all the way, all the way through like pretty sophisticated portfolio optimization techniques and they, they're all done as IPython notebooks and they've got references and diagrams and pictures and code samples. Like the, the thing that I love about the notebook, right, is it lets you sort of interleave code with narrative and so it's this really effective teaching tool. And then on top of that stuff, there's videos that go with them that uh, – Delaney, who's the engineer who's been working on all this stuff, um, his background is mostly in statistics and computer science. So he's done a really good job of uh, building these sort of tutorials for teaching people the basic tools for this. That is very cool. Because I think, in a sense, Quantopian, although it leverages all these other technologies, it really is kind of a technological platform unto itself. And, and it's like the challenges in getting people to adopt Quantopian seem to me to be very similar or if not identical to the challenges involved in easing adoption for people really of any technology or API or framework that you might be offering. So I think it's really super important and I, this is this is a drum that I beat at every opportunity that, and, and very cool that you guys recognize that and have invested the effort in providing good tutorials. And like you said, IPython Notebook is you know, my kind of education, right? Like here, here's this thing. I'm going to explain it to you. Now go try it. Now go play with it. Now break it, fix it. Right. You know, yeah. Like, that, I was going to say that piece is really cool that you can, right. You can open up one of these lectures, which are done in the notebook, clone it into your own account and then change it slightly. Like one of the things for me personally, that really helps me learn is to take something that I think I understand and then think about, well, if I change it in this way, how do I expect it to change? And then being able to see if my sort of thesis about the world actually holds true. Yeah. And getting that sort of reciprocal feedback from the thing that I'm learning, I think, is a really powerful way to come at a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. And maybe building on what you just said, sort of 
being able to edge yourself out, right? Like onto the ledge, you know, when you, because when you think about it, like the unknown in any circumstance, learning something new is about, you know, to an extent sort of conquering the unknown. And it's like, you know, dealing with the psychological aspects of that is much, much easier if you have a platform where you have a known working example and you can change small things and then change larger things. And before you know it, your training wheels are falling off and you're, you know, writing your own algorithmic training, trading, uh, you know, formulas. So that's very cool. Yeah. The other thing I think, too, that sort of comes with that, that sort of like the terror of the unknown thing is that I think the lecture series helps with is it has an order to it. Right. So there's. Like you, you show up and it says lesson one, linear regression, lesson two, linear correlation analysis, right? And there's this linear sequence of things where you'd say, well, you should learn this, and then you should learn this, and then you should learn this. And if you want to go skip through them, you can. But giving you sort of a concrete path through the topics, I think, is one of the sort of subtle benefits of it, that it doesn't just give you this blank slate and say, here you go, you know, learn this entire domain all at once. Right. So are there any other questions that you think that we should have asked or that you feel oh, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things like sometimes, you know, we, we try really hard to come up with a good set of questions that really sort of explore the topic, but you are the expert, right? So like maybe we're missing something or, or maybe there's just something that occurred to you that we didn't cover. Um, so I, I, I think you guys asked this a little bit and I sort of glossed over, but you mentioned, uh, you, you guys asked at the very beginning, like, why did we pick Python for um, Quantopian to, the, to begin with? And I talked a lot about, like, all the libraries and all the um, all these sort of things that exist in Python. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to come back to as we were talking about sort of IPython as a teaching tool and all that other stuff is that one of the other really powerful things that comes with Python is the interactivity of it uh, and having the ability to get immediate feedback on what you're working on, um, I think has also been a really important part of Python's success in the data science community. And I think we're seeing increasingly Python taking a larger and larger share of uh, data science because it has this great interactive story and it has this great data analysis story, but then it also is this very versatile general purpose programming language where you can do you know, you can do pandas and NumPy and all this stuff, but then you can also attach all that stuff to a web server. Or you can attach all that stuff to, um, you know, uh, some other, you know, programming domain where, you know, like R, for example, and I, I've, I've used R some. I'm not a huge R uh, person, so I, I will apologize to any R lovers who are also podcast in it uh, listeners. But so, like, R is great for statistical stuff, right? If you just want to crunch numbers and you want to do uh, some sort of fancy statistical model, there's probably an R package for that. But if you then want to hook that up to a web server or you want to like run that remotely on another machine or you want to do another sort of more general programming task, it the ecosystem dries up really fast. And so I think one of the things that's been great for us with Python is – Ha it having these really great focuses in numerical computing and in web stuff, but then also having this very broad sort of expansive base of uh, other skills and other libraries and other use cases. Um, and a lot of that comes from its sort of rich, long history of being around. But I think also the nature of the language itself has encourages, you know, these these very general purpose solutions. Absolutely. And just quickly, I really feel like the power of the REPL should never be underestimated. Totally. Uh, you know, I, I really feel very strongly for a while, it seemed like the REPL kind of fell out of favor, right? Like you had languages like Java and C and C++, not that they were new or anything, but mm -hmm. it just seemed like the emphasis was moving away from interpreted languages. And, and I just like... I'll admit, I am lost at sea when learning a new language if I don't have a REPL. I mean, I, I can do it, but it takes me an awful lot longer. For me, that ability to interactively play with expressions and noodle on things is just key to learning any new language or technology. Yep. I think especially, too, with Python, even compared to other languages that have REPLs, like we, we talked a little bit about Haskell earlier, and Haskell has a really good REPL. Uh, one of the things that it doesn't do super well that, and that's, and I don't think this is a knock on Haskell. It's like pretty deeply part of the design of the language, um, is that 
it doesn't have the rich introspection capabilities that Python has. So like one of the things that I love about Python, right, is if I'm trying to remember what some, like what the method signature of some pandas, uh, you know, some data frame method is or the data frame constructor, which takes a billion arguments, the fact that I can pull it up and in IPython do like data frame question mark and have it show me the doc string or do help of data frame and have it list all the methods for me and have, be able to sort of like introspect and interact with the code itself um, is really, really powerful and really, really, it, it's one of the things that makes Python a really productive language for me is that I often joke that I mostly use IPython as this interactive documentation engine, essentially, where <laughs> I, I have Emacs open in one terminal and I have a REPL open and the REPL is just there so that I can look up docs. Yeah. Right. And I can quickly see like what the signatures of the code that I'm writing are. And two, when you're working in the REPL, being able to view the current state of an object as well by just typing the dunder dict attribute and seeing what are all the different keys and values that are currently associated with this particular object. Totally. Yeah, REPL-driven development has definitely made my life a lot easier in a lot of ways when I'm working in Python and other languages that support it. To uh, parrot Chris's question, is there anything else that we didn't ask that you think we should have or anything that you want to bring up before we move to the picks? Uh, I don't think so. That's I feel like we got a pretty broad uh, swath of different stuff. All right, so with that, I will get us started. Uh, my first pick today is something called Kinetic Sand, and it's a lot of fun to play with. I have uh, kids who love to play with it. We actually have a sand table where they can mold it and mess around with it and use different toys to create shapes. And what it is is it's actually just regular sand, but it has food-grade silicon mixed into it so that it will stick together as if it were wet, but when you take your hands out of it, they stay completely clean and it sticks to itself and nothing else except other silicone items. So if you have uh, cooking tools that have silicone on them, don't let your kids put them in the uh, kinetic sand. Um, so I definitely recommend getting some and playing around with it. It's uh, very interesting to mess around and see how it flows and sort of the weird state that it w that it exists in, in terms of it's sort of a mix between a solid and a fluid in some ways. Um, huh. My next pick is a band called Trivium, and they're a very talented, very technical metal band that has had a lot of really great evolution in their sound over the years that they've been around. So each of their albums sort of has a different tenor to it where, you know, versus some bands where every album sounds kind of the same with Trivium, each album sort of takes their sound in a new direction and they did a, they do a lot of experimentation to evolve their skills. Uh, so definitely worth checking out. And my last pick is a website called Thrift Books, and it's a online marketplace for used books. They have really reasonable prices. The site is very well designed. It works great on mobile, has a lot of really great just little elements that uh, you don't necessarily notice at first, but really add to the experience. And with that, I will pass it to you, Chris. Great. Uh, my first pick today is a completely unintellectual <laughs> uh, game, but it's really, really well done. It's one of those things where, you know, it, it's not like this is a really, really deep game, but it is beautifully uh, constructed and, and contrived and, and built. Uh, it's called Threes, and it is a puzzle game. Um, it, it, I know you're going to say, oh, it's just like 2048, but 2048 was was essentially an homage to this like 2048 in its credits said you know by the way this is heavily inspired by threes and threes is way better than 2048 in, in a number of ways um, the audio visual experience is really cool each number has kind of a personality unto itself um, there's a lot more strategy in my opinion than 2048 in threes and it's just really well put together. It's, you can get it for mobile platforms. There's a clone for the web called threes.js. It's just, it's great fun. I keep it on my phone and when I'm stuck on the T and my brain is leaking out my ears and I can't, I don't have the, you know, the wherewithal to read. It's a great way to pass, it, pass some time. My next pick is a new series on Netflix. It's the same production company I've been told that made Daredevil for them. And I think it's really good. It's called Jessica Jones. It's a Marvel uh, series. And it's just this really great sort of dark, moody, um, 
it is a superhero story, but in a very unconventional way. Uh, and the the villain is just exquisite. He is quite a character. Uh, it's it's really good stuff. My last pick is a podcast series that if you, unless you were living in a cave, you may have heard of last year in its first season. It's back. The podcast is called Serial, and I think it's phenomenal. I think it's back with with a flourish. Um, uh, this this new season has a really compelling story about someone, uh, this gentleman who uh, was captured by the Taliban in a real... F- but the thing is, this is not your standard, like, you know, war hero, oh my goodness, we should be all swooning over him. He did some really questionable things and had some really kind of delusional ideas about what he was going to do and what he was going to accomplish. And as usual, the fo- these folks really make it into a compelling story. So I highly recommend Serial, both the first season, which was phenomenal, and this second season, at least that of it, which has come out so far, which is one episode. But uh, great stuff. Scott, what do you have for us in the picks? Cool. I, I will also, uh, I have played threes, and threes is excellent, so I will I will second your uh, recommendation for that. Um, so I have two two very bookish ones and one not. So I'll start with the my not bookish one, which is a, a game that uh, is probably the game that I have spent the most time playing of any game that I've ever played, which is Dota 2. Um, so Dota 2 is the uh, is a game made by Valve, who also made uh, the Half-Life games and Team Fortress and a whole bunch of other games. They pretty much, oh, and Portal and Left 4 Dead and all these other great games. They basically never made a game that wasn't phenomenal. Um, and it's the sequel to a Warcraft 3 mod called Dota, which stood for Defense of the Ancients, uh, Dota 2 technically does not stand for anything, so the game is just called Dota because of uh, conflicts with Blizzard. Um, but it's the sort of the original MOBA, so if you're familiar with League of Legends or Heroes of New Earth or any of these other like 5v5 team-based hero leveling up battle games, uh, Dota 2 is basically the originator of that genre and in my opinion, the still the best version of it that's ever been made. And they just released uh, a new big balance patch today, which I will probably go play after this because I'm real excited about it. <laughs> um, my second one, Changing Gears Entirely, um, is a philosophy book that was written in like the 1940s and published uh, maybe in the 1950s because it was not published until after its author died, uh, which is uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations. Um, so this is wearing my, my philosophy major heart on my sleeve a little bit. So this is, um, Wittgenstein was this guy who was part of this big movement in the late, in the thirties and forties of philosophy of language and who were trying to connect language with logic. And they had this idea that, uh, the way in his early career, he had this idea that the way to understand uh, language was by reducing it to logic and understanding that every sentence expressed some sort of abstract logical proposition. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, about his career as a philosopher is basically later in his life, so he he sort of builds up this program. He writes what he considers his magnus op- magnum opus called the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Um, and then he declares that he's solved all the problems of philosophy and goes off to become a school teacher. And <laughs> goes off for... Uh, several years, and then through conversations with other philosophers, basically decides that all of the ideas in his in the Tractatus were wrong and that he's totally misunderstood the point of language and that you can't understand language without, without taking into account how it's actually used by human beings and that philosophy of language needs to focus on uh, like this social context in which language is embedded and all the ambiguities that are – he was sort of trying to stamp out and avoid and – uh, theorize around, he realized are sort of central to the project of understanding language, that language is in, sort of essentially inherently ambiguous, and that's part of how we interact with one another as human beings. So I think it's, uh, it was one of the, it's sort of odd to say this, but like, it's a piece of intellectual work that I find like incredibly inspiring and incredibly interesting. And so if you're at all interested in uh, philosophy of language, I encourage you to take a look at that. It sounds great. It also sounds like it, you know he basically pulled the you know philosophic philosopher academics equivalent of 
saying, I win, and then he dropped the mic and went home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then but then the great thing about it is he did that and then came back and said, No, actually I was totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. And like had the intellectual integrity to uh basically renounce all of the other things that he had written. Not renounce, but uh I don't know. It's very it's it's the book is very interestingly written also because the the first book, the Tractatus, is this like it reads like a logic textbook. It's like proposition one, proposition two, theorem, proposition three. And then and it's like this very technical, rigorous piece of work. And then the philosophical investigations, it's these like little snippets and it's all like little paragraphs that are not necessarily directly related. And it's like this almost stream of consciousness t- style writing that's very interesting. I'm actually going to add one in here now while, while I uh, ad lib one is um, – if you're interested in sort of the intellectual history of philosophy of language and philosophy of mathematics in that time, there's a great, great book called Logic Comics, um, which is a graphic novel about Bertrand Russell, who was another philosopher in this time. Um, and it's it's Russell and David Hilbert and Wittgenstein and Kurt Gödel and all these people who are re- wrestling with these questions of uh, logic and meaning and mathematics and truth and language. Um, and it it's it doesn't sound like that would be an incredibly engaging piece of fiction or it's not fiction but it's like dramatized uh fiction about russell's life um i that was one of the things that originally got me interested in that topic so i'll 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 throw that one in uh before going on to the last one and then the the last one that i was gonna talk about is um is infinite jest which is my favorite novel um it's by an author named david foster wallace who wrote mostly in the the 90s and early 2000s um it's this giant brick of a novel it's uh it's really hard to explain it's it's like half set in a tennis academy and half in a halfway house and there's all these different characters and it's about like how to like think about art in contemporary america when we're saturated with things that are trying to be easy and trying to be seductive. So a lot of it is about the relationship between like novels and visual art and things that ask the reader, ask the consumer to do work and be difficult and how those relate to things like television and the internet. It's, it's actually written before the internet was really uh, as big as it is now, which I think is interesting because it's very prescient in a lot of ways um, sort of foreshadowing this idea that we so much of um so much of like our most precious resource now is sort of attention in a lot of ways, right? We have so many possible opportunities to be engaged and to be entertained and to be stimulated that it's hard for certain kinds of art or certain kinds of intellectual work to uh, not compete exactly, but like it's hard for us to bring ourselves to engage with those kinds of works in the way that you need to in order to get things out of them. And so it's asking this question, right, of like, how do we, if we believe that those kinds of works are valuable and that they, you know, they provide certain kinds of experiences or certain kinds of stimulation that you can't get from something that's a little bit more superficial and a little bit easier, like what's the role of that in our lives? And it it ties that in interesting ways to addiction and to religion and faith and to sort of being a part of something larger than yourself. Um, I can't recommend it enough. I think David Foster Wallace is a brilliant, brilliant author. It, it kind of reminds me a lot of a book that I have not read, but I keep seeing referenced over and over and over again called, um, I believe it's Entertaining Ourselves to Death, about how our society is so fixated on uh, immediate gratification and sort of, you know, Twitch-based entertainment that we are losing our ability to focus on anything meaningful, kind of similar to what you were saying there. Um, and as far as the logic comics, I have not read that one in particular, but I have read a very similar series called like the cartoon guide to, um, philosophers, various philosophers. Like I read the cartoon guide to Heidegger, the cartoon guide to, and there are a few others and it, they are actually really, really, uh, there's actually something really, and I, th- I think it's, they're actually by the same guy, I mean the same publisher. And he also did like the cartoon guide to history, philosophy, chemistry. And there's actually something, and in fact, modern day bloggers, I forget which one now, maybe it was Saranya Bark, but I can't, I, I'm, I'm getting that wrong, I bet. There's a number of prominent modern bloggers who have kind of made their name 
also in terms of explaining some kind of complex concepts in the form of cartoons. And I actually think there's a tremendous amount of power in that medium to kind of trick us into conveying these things that could otherwise be really dry. But when you're consuming it in that format, it's like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down kind of thing, you know, and you you actually do wind up walking away with maybe actually having thought about something that was kind of profound and kind of changed your worldview a little bit when in reality, you know, you're reading this book full of cartoons. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, that's uh, that also reminds me of um, Randall Monroe, the guy who writes XKCD, yeah. just came out with a new book, The uh, Thing Explainer, which is all explaining these like complex engineering things using only the thousand most common used English words. And so it's full of great things like, you know, the, the Saturn rocket is the upgoer five. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it says if, if this end is not pointing toward the ground, then you will not go to space today. So it's this very sort of simple language, but it still manages to capture a lot of the core ideas of these complex things. And I, I I actually have not yet gotten that one, so I can't recommend it, but I look forward to reading it when I get the chance to. All right. So for anybody who wants to follow what you're up to and keep in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Sure. So uh, on if you're interested in some of the technical things that I'm working on, so Zipline and IPython and the PyData stuff, you can find me on... Uh, GitHub. Uh, I'm S. Sanderson on GitHub. I am, I think, Scott B. Sanderson on Twitter. I should probably know that offhand, but I only fairly recently joined Twitter. Um, but I believe I'm Scott B. Sanderson on Twitter. Um, and you can also find me, my email address at Quantopian is scott at quantopian.com. Great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us and tell us about algorithmic trading and your work at Quantopian. It's been very interesting, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it as well. Cool. Great. Thank, thank you guys for uh, having me on. It really has. And I, and I have to say, it's kind of funny. I have a couple of weeks vacation coming up here at the end of the year. And not that I'm going to spend the entire time because I want to spend some time with my wife and go like <laughs> enjoy the world. But I, I will say that knowing that it, this stuff is free to sort of even just, you know, start to poke around and you guys have some really great tutorials out there, I may actually invest some time in, you know, at least exploring it if, if only to understand what it's about and have a sense of it because it sounds really neat. I mean, it sounds like it, it would be even just, you know, as a technologist kind of fun to explore what you guys have built. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like lots of people on Quantopian do it as a hobby. It's not like their full time job or anything. It's a thing which the irony, right, is like we've built this platform about encouraging people to come and do what would be in another context, like a paid job, right? Like a, a pretty serious amount of work to write code that does this very sophisticated thing. And people come and we're sort of, I guess, hopefully not too surprised, but always sort of kind of amazed that people come and do this really hard work because they enjoy it and find it engaging and interesting. Yeah, definitely a very interesting platform and a very interesting problem domain. So thank you again for taking the time to explain it to us. And I hope you enjoy your time <laughs> playing the new Dota 2 expansion. I, I will do that. All right. <laughs> good night. Uh, have a good See evening. See you guys.